Cool. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here again. Thanks for our speakers. I, yeah, I wrote a lot of notes. I love to take notes just in pay with my pen and paper. So sorry about that, but I just love it. Um, it was a very interesting morning. I have a lot of questions, of course, and we just have, a, let's say, well, not, I, 40 minutes, yeah, more or less. Um, I hope to have the time to leave some time for your questions as well, because I, uh, I saw that at the, at the end of each speech, a lot of people were asking questions, and maybe we didn't have the time. Um, I have to say, I, I can't help uh, myself about thinking about a verse of one of my favorite teenage songs. It was Sunday Bloody Sunday by U2. It was just like, it, it goes just like, when well, fact is fiction and TV is reality, maybe a lot of you <laughs> remember about it. And uh, uh, so as Walter told us, uh, um, um, misinterpretation or um, I don't know, yeah, misinterpretation of fact is not an uh, internet or web problem, it's as old as humanity. Uh, I have to say, uh, I, I start with you, Walter, be Walter, because at the very end of your speech, uh, I had a big question, and it was just like, so what? I mean, I loved it so much, I liked it so much, I didn't tweet because I didn't want to distract myself. But uh, my question remained, uh, we know, you, you said uh, fact don't exist anymore, it is just perception. It's not, it's not a problem of today, uh, but maybe today is bigger, it's a bigger problem because of the platform, because of the social media, because of the flux, because of the uh, fastness and stuff like that. But at the very end, what is your answer to this? I mean, uh, the title of this panel is Can We Beat uh, uh, Misinformation and How? So I don't know, it's not a recipe, but in a way, uh, Massimo and Elian just gave us some ideas about how to do it. Uh, you said uh, uh, authority is very linked, uh, truth is linked to authority, and maybe we have to go back to, to give experts the authority they had before. And uh, Massimo showed us some examples about uh, this intermediation in a, I mean, in a good way, both for tragedy or for laughing. <laughs> uh, I, I want to know if she was on any drugs anyway, because... <laughs> no, she was no. looking for a birthday present. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you, you didn't uh, tell us, you didn't leave us any recipe, if any, about how to do it how to beat misinterpretation and uh, disinformation in a way. How to do it if people want to believe in this kind of new, in polarization, want to stay stuck to, to their ideas? Uh, to be honest, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, I assume that we have to accept this fact as a fact. Even thinking that uh, there should be we have to find a solution is a misinterpretation. Because <laughs> since we don't know the exact shape of the phenomenon, we are still striving and moving to our wishful thinking. For instance, uh, we are, I mean, someone on Twitter just was arguing that narcissism, uh, the key, basically looking at this uh, phenomenon like uh, narcissism is not proven by research. Actually, it's not true. Actually, there are tons of papers that are basically correlating our behavior, narcissistic behavior, on Facebook. Actually, what I mean by narcissism is, not, is just this distance between the real self and the projection online. We create an image of ourselves online. This distance, this gap, basically create, uh, make us more prone to looking for interpretations that are consistent. So basically, it maximizes our tendency to oversimplify. So my, my, my idea, actually, we are trying to deal with the problem in several directions. From one side, we are trying to build this observatory, which I would like really to be, you, you to be involved in, in which we want to make, uh, create um, a synergy between journalists, uh, scientists, and communication scientists in a way that we can deal with the phenomenon and try to understand which way of framing story 
is more efficient in communicating uh, the most correct information, correct, if we can say that. On the other side, we did an initiative uh, during the bright night uh, in Lucca that was basically uh, making people laughing and talking, so learning to listening. We did Scienza e Porchetta, Bufale e Porchetta, that basically was, uh, the idea was to make people uh, join a group to enjoy listening and talking to each other, and the approach was just really peer-to-peer. -peer. I was just driving at uh, the beginning the interaction, and people start to talk among each other, and there was this process of listening. Then uh, there are other options that we have to move on because actually the problem from the misinformation, the reverse side of this uh, monster, is that uh, our experiment, the first part, uh, the cognitive inoculation part, proved that online we can be manipulated. In, in if we inject in this... Uh, Not in only online, I guess. Yeah, but it's, there is a really, it's really easy to go inside there because it's not like... Yeah. A, you, can, you can inject the virus the precise virus for the echo chamber, and you can drive the formation of, of the opinions. This is, I think, the, the biggest warning, more than uh, the rational uh, willingness. So the point to me, to be really synthetic, is to uh, accept that the world is not platonic and we cannot uh, solve everything. Even logic and mathematics accepted uh, this uh, 50 years ago and uh, start to think that we are, we are fr in, in fr dealing with something that is really, really complicated and complex, uh, that is the social, our society. Those are just the expression of our thoughts, of our dynamics, of our engagement with uh, life. And accounting for this, then we could start to drive possible solution, but still, we don't know if there is a solution. Okay. You're still investigating in it? Yeah, I was assuming that you, do, you didn't have a recipe or a, or a solution. One solution fix all, but just to, to have an idea about your next moves on it. Um, speaking on dictatorships of, dictatorship of likes uh, and the narcissism behind uh, Facebook and stuff, I want to ask everybody so you can... Uh, you can answer in the, the way you, you, you prefer. Uh, what about the, the, the new platform that are shifting the likes paradigm? I was thinking about the Snapchat, Snapchat using in a way, using it for news uh, with Discover, with the experiment of Discover, and the possibility to share con journalistic content uh, on Snapchat. Snapchat, uh, doesn't have any like, doesn't have any appreciation, doesn't have any metric. I mean, it does, but not in the way that Facebook or Twitter, not so immediate. I mean, Facebook, you just write, you have the like, you have the sharing, and you're happy with it. Snap, in Snapchat, you don't have a profile page, you just have a figure, a number that shows uh, if you're active or not in the platform. So actually, you don't have a, a real metrics. Uh, I'm still, of course, investigating, just everybody is, about the, the possibility to use it at a, as a platform to distribute journalistic content. But we don't have the likes, we don't have the narcissism, or yes, we have the narcissism as well. So the problem is just shifting to, to another level. I don't know if... Oh, it's tricky, isn't it? I mean, I think it's it's tricky, this issue of, you know, morals and making these ethical judgments. Are we more narcissistic now than before? Um, have we always been subject to con confirmation bias and so on? Um, I mean, on the narcissism point, I think that we used to have um, a functioning ecosystem by which knowledge was disseminated to the public, and that was, you know, for example, journalism. And journalists became journalists, you know, partly for narcissistic reasons, but that narcissism was kind of incorporated into a, into a professional framework that actually this was just about getting a job that you, you know, that you thought was um, worthwhile and that you were valued by society for doing that job. You know, all my students, when I teach at university, all my students want to be old-fashioned journalists, you know. <laughs> 
and they, despite the fact they're all addicted to their phones, and I'm kind of, and I say to them, but do you not realise these whole industries are dying? But they all want to be journalists, they all want to be authors, they all want to have that old-fashioned accredited status. Um, but I think there isn't anything wrong with that. But I think that if you if you strip away the the infrastructure, then all you have is the raw human, you know, the frailty, you know, the narcissism. And actually, once it's in, when it was incorporated into a structure of career advancement, of professional recognition, then it was somehow absorbed. Um, I mean, it, I think this issue, just going on to this issue of you know, what's new and what's kind of timeless, you know, what's a timeless constant is a really interesting one. It's cro cropped up in a few talks. Um, I mean, yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, Walter, we, we, are, we have always been subject to confirmation bias. Um, so then we have to ask, well, what's new now? What has changed? We've always had debates about truth and reality and manipulation, you know, and Shakespeare plays and sort of, you know, Greek philosophers and so on. It goes all the way back. But so what exactly is new now? And I think that what I was arguing is that we have lost that ecosystem um, by which we, you know, had sort of official filters and agreed modes of, of um, to know what is truth, and that was underpinned by authority, and that has changed. Um, so it's not just it's not the case that you know. Well, of, I mean, of course, there's nothing, there's no such thing as a fact, and that's always been the case. But what we have had is these kind of socially agreed ways of dealing with that kind of philosophical reality. Uh, well, mm, as I tried to say that before, also the, um, we I think it could be interesting to focus on the rules that are, are uh, mm, somehow uh, the mm, silent rules that are uh, governing interaction in such, for example, Snapchat instead of Facebook. That uh, at the end, uh, yes, definitely. They have uh, rules there, and there is no. Uh, you have not to sign the rules before when you enter. Just the privacy, but you, nobody reads it. But I mean, uh, the rules of interaction are uh, somehow uh, drive by the, the tool and the people that use it. So I think there could be a um, point of observ observation, uh, which is uh, quite interesting. And uh, one word about this, um, yeah, the, the facts. Effect, effectively, also, and I hope in my presentation this uh, passed, that uh, we observe, use, um, observe opinion, but opinion about uh, what? About facts or about the reality? We observe opinion about uh, our reality that met with somebody else's reality. It probably is an opinion as well. So this is a really Chinese box stuff, and so this, uh, this uh, what I wanted to show was this: that uh, um, th this uh, tools can be useful, but um, we must be have clear clear of what are we representing with the data, with the numbers. Um, it was interesting to uh, these things that uh, numbers uh, in the last presentation, numbers um, give the context to facts, but also numbers must be put in a context. <laughs> so also this is uh, something that uh, we should take care of. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, Massimo, do you have uh, something to add about this? Uh... I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just... Uh, they're all scholars. I'm just um, a witness of, of what is happening. So um, I, I, I do not have recipes, but I try to observe what is happening. And I think we have a lot of tools. I think it's um, to, to reestablish uh, uh, facts. I think uh, that we as a journalist can do a great job putting things in perspective and with contest and uh, trying to be VJs, as I said during my presentation, of, uh, of the huge amount of, of documents that uh, 
overwhelms us of live and whatever that, it, the, that is on the internet. And I think this is the most powerful thing that has happened ever. And of course, it's complex. Of course, we don't get it. Of course, uh, it's difficult. I think that uh, some of the things that have been said this morning by all these scholars are, are, are true. Of course, I, 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 I recognize myself in, in what they said, in what I saw. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I would not declare defeat because the, there has never been um, a more interesting moment to be involved in this as this one. And even if, if it was not like this, this is our time. This is our culture. Uh, this is the year in which we are. We have to be contemporary, otherwise there would be no, no scope in living here at this moment. So let's try and see what happens. Yeah, that's for sure, and maybe we are already a little bit late in living the moment, so uh, we don't have to wait uh, anymore to live in the flux. That, that's for sure. Um, I just want to put into connection two things. Uh, one I read in uh, Pew Research a couple of days ago, and the other is something that Eliane said in uh, her presentation, in her speech. I read that uh, in, um, more than one-third of Americans that are on social media are declared to, be, to feel exhausted about the debate, the pres presidential debate on social media. More than one-third, which is not... Uh, uh, I mean, which is not bad just to, to read it and think about it. Most of all about the tones, the tones of the debate. Um, actually, I also read on Pointer a very interesting interview um, uh, of Dave D'Alessio, who is a professor of communication that uh, followed all the presidential of the last, let's say, 20 years from a communication point of view. And he said something like, uh, uh, there's no evidence uh, of, the, of the fact of, that the media are biased, uh, because bias is just a, a pair of lenses that we have. So we don't have the perception of bias. Uh, and everybody f says the media is biased because uh, they don't write uh, the way they want to, to, to read, uh, the articles they want to read, and they are the opposite side. So there's nothing different between this pres presidential campaign and the other ones uh, in these terms. Uh, but speaking about the one third, uh, more than one third of Americans on social media that are fed up about uh, presidential debate uh, on social, do you think it's connected about uh, what you said about the fact that we have, we need to regain authority and we need to give voice to people that are entitled to have this voice, that are experts on their matter. Uh, because, I mean, uh, you said something like uh, uh, the inter internet created the cult of amateur and, uh, you know, experts are not on the pedestal anymore, which is good from a, I mean, the democratic point of view, let's, uh, let's say democratic point of view. But it's not very good because we have a lot of information, way too much, uh, and a lot of misinformation. So people are fed up right now about reading all this stuff and the tones of it, uh, which are really, uh, really bad and really angry. Okay, <laughs> found it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I suppose I think history is important to to help us to understand our contemporary moment. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's why I was trying to talk about rhetoric and ideology, which are kind of forgotten terms, really, these days. So people just talk about rhetoric as if it was a bad thing. Oh, that's just, that's actually lies. That's just hot air rhetoric. You know, you're, you're using, you know, ornamented words to persuade people. But actually rhetoric was, a, well, as I was saying, was an explicit p process of persuasion that politicians used and ideology was an explicit set of beliefs that they said, this is what we believe, and then you can either agree with me or not, and then we can have a democratic contest about this. Now, ideology is, is, a, is a dirty word. You know, it's only the other side who are ideological. We're just, we're just kind of doing what works in this kind of empirical you know, way, truthful way, authentic way. So um, 
I suppose my problem is that there's too much on the on the there's too little on the supply side. So politicians aren't standing up and saying, "We are leaders. It's our job to set out a platform. You can either agree or not." Um, and actually, I read a very interesting thing recently about political satire, which basically said that political satire, at least in the UK, is kind of dead. Like, there was this golden age of political satire, you know, a couple of decades ago, spitting image and the day-to-day -day and so on. But actually now, people are so fed up with politicians and they're so denigrated and so actually knocked off the pedestals that actually political satire, there's nothing to take aim at. So these political satirists themselves were saying, we need to respect political office more so that we can at least have some, some way to kind of have a critical distance between us and politics. And I think that's sort of what's collapsed, is that we're living in a kind of um, a sort of um, t almost totalitarian space, although it's kind of less kind of, you know, sexy in a sort of sci-fi dystopian way. It's kind of a boring totalitarian space, really. Um, in which there's no space to critique because there's nothing to kind of, there's nobody to knock down. But what the right are doing is they're setting, setting these politicians up and still saying, hey, they're so powerful. Hey, look at, you know, how they abuse their expenses claims, you know. You know, this is right after the financial crisis when we just injected a trillion dollars into the banking system. Um, but, but the real problem with these, with these politicians who are spending, you know, 50p on a, a bath plug you know, and claiming it, you know, from the public purse, as though this was the problem. I mean, I think in terms of the, the data, you know, I think, as I said, you know, we're spending too much time trying to collect data of people's opinions, as though those things were somehow these truths that you can collect, that the data can grab. They're these kind of unmovable, true opinions. And actually, what I want is more supply side, more persuasion, um, and less kind of endlessly trying to harvest, you know, people's views. Because as we know, or as we should know, people's views are influenced from above. And that, that's what I want to get back to. Do you want to add something? Mm, yeah. What uh, was um, interesting, uh, um, the last... Um, the uh, speech uh, was this video in the in the sea with migrants, and uh, what uh, was uh, what uh, astonished me is that um, about the um, uh, authority of uh, the institutional uh, journalism or uh, science is that um, basically uh, our data this. Um, Frustration against uh, migrants uh, was very uh, growing, and uh, the, the 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 argument people are using uh, to uh, is on the institutional side. Uh, there is this uh, big amount of numbers to uh, show uh, the proportion of the thing and how this. Um, uh, for example, the number of the migrants uh, toward the number of uh, European population, the num the the taxes they we are owing. And on the other side, uh, who uh, is uh, is uh, trolling the um, the fire on on this uh, rage uh, uses stories, uses uh, stories of people who had uh, also a lot of uh, bank stuff. But I mean, and it's, it's people remember story, but doesn't remember numbers. So this uh, is uh, something uh, we, we should take in account. And so, okay, yes, I'm. Uh, I, I think also the, the two mass numbers have no impact without, uh, without stories, a story, a story which course, drives yeah. them. This is not a, a discovery, but <laughs> in this case, uh, it it's was really stronger. evident. Yeah, okay. and it's very evident, it's really stronger. Yeah, the power of stories, of course, we are totally devoted, devoted to stories. Thanks, uh, and um, just one more thing about uh, the authority of journalists, because uh, it's a very big issue, of course. Uh, Massimo, you talked about context. Uh, our role seems to be uh, today, more, more than yesterday, to give the context in, uh, in which stories are developing and uh, stuff are uh, happening. But um, 
uh, we're living in a world in which even the home pages, uh, and we know about the innovation uh, report of New York Times a couple of years ago, uh, which were, let's say, one of the last uh, portion of context, old style context that we provided to readers are not uh, very useful anymore because, I mean, uh, home pages are not visited anymore or not as they were before. So, uh, how can we give context? How can journalists and uh, professionals of information, let's say, not only journalists in an Italian way, of, uh, uh, can give context uh, today, can, can help uh, readers uh, to, to, to have, let's say, the right framework uh, to better understand uh, the information? And do you think that to, for, for regaining authority, it, it's important to, uh, let's say, to select experts from amateurs again, as we did before? No, I, I, I don't necessarily think so. It's, it's not necessary. Um, how do we reestablish a hierarchy beyond the homepage? Uh, well, I want to be provo provocative on this, but the home page is dead. The website is dead. You have, you have to bring this to, a, to a, um, uh, a single topic. There you can work reestablishing, trying to reestablish um, contest. And so you have to think of, of your job not on your site. This, of course, is not dead, literally speaking, but will not be anymore the center of your effort. Um, everything has to be distributed, so you have to go on platforms. Uh, we might not like Facebook and Snapchat, but the, that's where people are. So, so fish where the fish we, are. We have, we, have, we have to be at service of, of the people. This, this is what we are supposed to do, so we have to go there and find them and, and put uh, contests there, bring contests there, be, bring, bring depth there. And the other thing is uh, give voice to the, the less heard, to people, to, to people who, who have a voice and can express itself. Okay, we have uh, to, to, to bring that into light. As, as it was done with, with the footage of the migrants. The footage was there, and nobody just asked to the migrants for it. Just go there, ask them, they will give it to you, walk on it for two or three months, and this is what comes out, an untold stories, coming from the voice of the less earth. So, there's a lot of job to do, there's a lot of work. But it's not about time, not at all. Cool. Yeah, it's very interesting, and I agree with you because maybe the big misunderstanding was to put on social media or in general on digital platform the same, uh, the identic content, content for everyone, ten or a hundred versions of the same story while a lot of stories to be told remained uh, untold because nobody investigated on it. Yeah, I think there's also a, a bit of echo chamber of ourselves in this because uh, Facebook can be many things. I've seen migrants arriving on the shore and the first thing they ask you is, how can I find a connection? Because yeah. I have to, to connect on Facebook to let people at home that I'm safe and to see which is the safest route. Because of course, the internet is not just the worldwide internet, but it's made by many, many nets. And some of them are really personal, made of friends, made of, of people that count for us. So for them, knowing that they cannot pass through Hungary because there's a wall there and they have to go through Macedonia or whatever, it's really important, and these are the tools of today. These are the tools that they use. So if, if we change our perspective and we, we understand that we are not, and we have never been, in fact, at the center of the world anymore, and this is, I think, it's very healthy. Thanks. Elian, do you want to add something? Yeah, um, 
Thanks, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you. That video was really powerful, but I think it, the, the question is, what does powerful mean? So it's very powerful to us to watch it, and anyone who does come across it will find it powerful in moving. Um, but how much power does it have? And I think that's what I want data to do, is to analyse where the power lies. And, you know, and it is, but it is a game of cat and mouse, is that you have these voice, individual voices of people who have been sidelined, and sometimes their voices are, held, are heard, but the, then those voices are co-opted. So those individual testimonies can then be co-opted by the big tech multinationals to say, look, we are giving ordinary people a voice. You know, so it's a, it's a game on both sides, I think. Sure. Um, and, and also those images have to fight in this kind of Im increasingly saturated video-driven market. And, and I think, you know, and I realised I didn't answer your question really about why people were hated the, you know, so sick of the coverage of yeah. the election. And it's, be yeah. Yeah, and it's because it's really easy to, because people are fighting, they're talking about the easy issues, you know, whether Clinton is nasty or not. You know, politics is, a, is about difficult decisions and prioritisation. And, but that's not what people are arguing about. But the, but the people's attention is saturated by these simplistic issues. So, yeah, so how, how, do, you, how do you push through that? Uh, just, just a clarification on powerful. Um, I think that if we were able to bring stories like this in light, uh, people might decide uh, in a different way. I know that in, in a speech a few days ago, Trump said, uh, you know what, if I shot somebody, you would still vote for me. I know that. But nevertheless, I think that people in Gorino, we had a case a few days ago of Gorino, a small town in the northeast of, of, of Italy where uh, um, 12 uh, migrants, women, were supposed to be hosted and the population uh, didn't want them and uh, didn't let them um, arrive in the city. So I suppose that the 400 citizens of Gorino, if there were somehow confronted with footage like this. And if somebody would have told them a different story from the one they have been hearing for two and a half years from the politicians uh, locally, telling them that the migrants are, are going to rape their women and so on, and then steal their jobs, probably things uh, would be different. I, I would say, I would like to see, I'm, I, I love relativity, but I would like to see, I'm convinced and I'm sure that it would happen because I believe in human beings. Uh, let's hope so. Uh, maybe next time. But yeah, um, I just want to add one more thing about the, um, the need to create a context again, uh, just like you said, and also the need to avoid people being fed up because of the, uh, well, let's say, um, overwhelmed by the, the tons of information. And it's one skill that it's very important to develop, in my opinion, but not only mine, uh, which is the con content curation skills. Because uh, it's not only, I mean, um, anymore a matter of producing new content, but also to, to do a good cherry picking and to do good content curation, just to help readers find their way. Because if sometimes we journalists are kind of uh, confused about the abundance of, of stuff on the web. You can imagine readers that, that maybe they don't have our tools yeah. and our capability to, to understand uh, and to find a way. Um, so content creation, I guess, it's very, it's not new, of course, but it's uh, more and more powerful inside an, a good, a good and, and uh, digital newsroom. I have one more question for you, Walter, about uh, if you had, of course, if you had something to add about the things we said uh, uh, till now, you can do it. But um, 
Um, you helped me so much, I have to say thank you, because when I wrote my book, uh, I, you helped me so much with the chapter about fact-checking and debunking, of course. And I read with great interest what you, what you wrote. Um, Massimo said, we're not defeat, we're just waiting to, and to, 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 to see what, what is happening. We, we're living in the moment, but we're not defeat. Actually, what you showed in your presentation seems just like, uh, it seems useless to go on with fact checking. Well, very difficult to go on with fact checking and, and debunking right now because uh, uh, you're overwhelmed about the quantity of fake stuff you can you find in the internet and it's kind of or not useless but maybe too difficult or you have another idea about it still we, we have to go on of course uh, and to go on fact checking everything definitely i mean the problem on my opinion is that the large amount of information is just uh, a second order effect of the explosion of the complexity of reality the problem is that our cognitive abilities is not able to process the complexity of reality. So even the journalists uh, have to deal with this uh, presentation, so creation of a context, of a narrative, in a system in which, for instance, we are basically, uh, let's be honest, I mean, on the Brexit, no one knows what is going to happen. No one knows, even the economist. It's just there are a co connection of hypotheses. So we, we have to lose, we have to accept that the world is not deterministic. Combination of factors, combination of factors may lead to um, the emergence of unexpected stuff. So we have to account for this. There is not a way to tell a story in a way that is objective. Logic, Gödel, told this, uh, I mean, 60 years ago. Mathematics is not able to describe itself. That is actually, I'm biased on that for sure, but it, we are just saying that our language, so Basically, our way of modeling stuff in science is not sufficient to describe reality. So accepting this is the first step toward the definition of a paradigm to fight misinformation. So we have to deal, we have to continue in doing fact-checking, debunking, and so on, but we have to account that we have to accept. I mean, it's wishful thinking, willing to describe the world in a way that is we can divide the world in something that is correct and incorrect. Because when we are talking about the Brexit, when we are talking about uh, the economical crisis, when we are talking even about science, science is not a, do is not a religion. Science creates contradiction, creates opposition, advance is a knowledge process, a human process that reflect, reflect our cognitive limit. So let's uh, take it easy, keep, I mean, let's keep going let's with that. Let's face it. Yeah. <laughs> I, see, I saw that Eliane maybe had a, a closing remark about, probably about Brexit, or I don't know. Well, yeah, I, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Brexit was just a complete mess, the whole thing from start to finish. <laughs> that's um, the good way, that's mess. <laughs> the good way to describe it. But I mean, for me, the frustrating thing for me was that the politics was not there in the, de in the debate. So there is a political debate to be had about deindustrialized regions of the UK where working class people no longer have jobs um, and you know, economic inequality and, the, and global financial power and the effect that it's having on ordinary people. To me, that was the issue. That was the political debate to, to be had. Um, or do we just let the free markets kind of do their thing? But that was not the political debate that we had. The debate we had was a kind of, it was a proxy debate about identity, about race, racism, about liberal elites, whatever that means. You know, it, all of the political debate that should have been had was channeled into these false categories. And then those two false categories then slugged it out on social media producing nothing of use politically. So that was my frustration. And, and in, in addition to that, that, that um, it was supposedly this great you know, triumph for ordinary people, but what the reality was that it was a conservative prime minister who defends the interests of the financial elite using the royal prerogative to bypass the Houses of Parliament and reimpose her timetable for exit. So it was a precise inversion 
of the kind of way it was talked about politically as this kind of great, you know, revolutionary moment. So, yeah, so, so the terms of the debate have just been completely sort of distorted and inverted. And, and it's very difficult for the, the analysis to, to cut through. And what you say, yeah, uh, it's very clear what you said, and it, it seems to me that in a way it, uh, it is what is happen happening right now in Italy for the, for the referendum of December. So it's, it's the same kind of thing, to shift in the attention from the political debate to other kind of issues that are not related to, I mean, they are related to, but they're not the main or the focus uh, issues to debate for. If you have something more to add, or at least I, we just have uh, some seconds, but I'd like to, to, to give the, the microphone to you if you have any questions for, uh, for our speakers that uh, were very good to, to make clear their points uh, and to help un us understand about how can we get this information, which is not um, an easy question to, to answer, of course. Uh, we just try to give some suggestions. Any more questions? Are you longing for lunch? No, we do, we do have another, we do have another uh, very good speech you have to wait for. <laughs> okay, thank you so much and thank you for listening. Thank you.